So um, this is the paper that uh, I'll be discussing um, called Gated Linear Networks. Uh, it appeared earlier this year on Archive. As far as I know, it's, it has not been published in any venue. Um, paper is by a group at DeepMind and they had an earlier longer version of this paper too that was published that was well it appeared online about three years ago and as far as I know that was not published either so I don't think it's been published in any venues yet. So I'll start my presentation. All right so um, so I found this uh, paper quite interesting and I thought it had some parallels to our uh, dendrites project. Um, so I think the, the main, so they, pre, they present a new predictive model yep. in this paper. And the main two, the two most important points that I would want to point out here is that first, um, so, so it's a neural network model, but each unit is, um, is making a prediction of the output and not necessarily building an intermediate representation like you have in typical deep learning layers where you do backprop so that certain layers are, I guess, make, uh, transforming the data in complex ways so that your ultimate layers can, um, can make uh, a prediction. It's not really like that. Every unit here is sort of predicting. Uh, and secondly, uh, each unit is learning locally. So there's no, there's no, um, there's no backward pass in this. We're not using backpropagation to train each, um, the learn, the, each unit has its own loss that is defined independently and it's updating its own weights based on that local objective there. So no backprop. Um, and I do wanna say about the prediction that this prediction, at least in all the, in all the context that they spoke about uh, this network, it was always a binary prediction. So zero one. So they would output a probability value between zero and one, that would be some real number. And that would be an indication of whether it's zero or one. So generally this is how it works. Um, you have, you have uh, you have an input. They they refer to this. This is basically like their context, um, but really it's just the it's just a regular input to each unit, um, and then so that goes into each unit, and then it's it's and it, and then based on that, that unit is making a prediction. So it's going to put a number between zero and one, and then all those numbers, which are basically just its prediction values, are inputs to are go as input to the next unit, even though these are like predictions and not necessarily um, some sort of useful features that the next unit is going to make use of. So it's it's outputting these predictions in this layer and then all those predictions are going to the next layer and then it's doing the same thing and then ultimately the very last layer will only have one unit and that's making the final zero one prediction that the network makes and so that that at a high level that's how it's working and then as each unit gets its input and uh, makes its prediction it can update right there so it doesn't have to wait for the forward pass to go all the way to the end layer um, so that it can get it's gradient signal. As soon as it's made its prediction, it can update right there. So from a very high, high level, that's what's what. Happening. What knowledge? Uh, what is the training signal for making that update? Uh, so it so um, it's it no it, it has the it has the target as well. So whether it's um, whether it's zero or one, whatever, whatever it's trying to predict. How does it know that target? You've got a bunch of layers and neurons here. How does the how does well? There's target? there's only one input, right? So the target is going to be the same for every single unit. So the target is like basically globally available. Oh, I see. Target every like, so yeah. while we're training, it's either one or zero. Everybody gets that. Yeah. There's no differentiation at all. Exactly. Uh -huh. and, 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 that, and that's, I think that's the biggest difference from like regular neural, ne neural networks because in a regular neural network or, or an intermediate unit here, what, what it should be outputting is based on whatever is most useful for the next layer to make its predictions. And so, um, and so there's no, there's no like, it's not looking at the global target value, but here. Does, it, does that mean that these only work for uh, binary networks? Is it binary classifiers? Is that, is that the Yeah, so in the paper, they only talked about sort of binary tasks, but, um, but they, but uh, as, as, I'll, as I'll talk about later, um, they do like, uh, they do an MNIST classification. And in that case, what they're doing is they're just, they just have 10 of these and they're all like one versus all classifiers. So it's telling you, so one of them is telling you whether it's a zero or not. And the next one's telling yeah. you the one or not. I mean, that seems like a pretty big limitation, right? Yeah. Um, that really you just have the binary classifiers. You like a whole, a whole bunch of them, but uh, binary classifiers, it, it, it seems on first blush that the, the method by which they're doing the training here re requires that. If I gave it a, a multivariable, um, a multivariate um, output to this network, um, I'm not sure you could, all neurons could share that as a training signal. Um, seems like they probably couldn't. I'm, I, but I do think that um, it's probably it won't wouldn't be too difficult to um, modify this so that it could output it could have multiple output values. Really? But I, I, I how, would it, how would that happen? Yeah. 
Well, instead of outputting a single value, it'd have to output yeah. like a, a vector of values. Yeah, but but that means every every neuron in the network would have to be training on that sort of vector uh, response. Yeah. So it's like, okay, if I have a thousand categories, every neuron is going to be telling, you know, every neuron is going to be getting this thousand category distribution or whatever. And um, it's not clear how, it's not clear how that would work in this situation. Um, they do use it uh, for things like MNIST later on where there's like, let's say 10 categories. And I think they just build one of these per category. Yeah, I think that's what, yeah. the, that's what the Karanta said. You know, yeah, you yeah. have 10, 10 separate binary classifiers, but that's not really a scalable system of any sort of AI to real. I mean, it could solve some problems, but it doesn't seem like a path to, you know, AI. I mean, it seems, I mean, it's an interesting technique. I, I, I can see it. It's interesting, but it seems to have inherent limitations in it, if I'm interpreting it correctly. Well, one idea we discussed in the past, Jeff, when uh, Priya was at Nementa, yeah. of each intermediate layer, so let's say you have like 50 layer at deep neural network. So each layer is also trying to predict the output. And at the same time, is uh, it's part of the feed forward of a deeper network, but it's also independently trying to predict the output. But then mm -hmm. you have to attach a small linear layer uh, at the end of each layer. So that small linear layer that we attach acts like a classifier. So it's mm -hmm. like you have a main thread going on, and you have like an exit at, at each layer yeah. to predict the target. So that would be an alternative where you can uh, move. Yeah, I've for forgotten that one, but. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm just, I'm sure there's things, if you make these networks, obviously if you add more types of layers and complications, then maybe you could move this in any different direction. But I was just looking at this one picture saying, Hey, how is that going to work? <laughs> yeah. um, okay. So uh, this is what each individual unit is doing. Um, so it's taking in the predictions from the previous layer. Um, and so you can think of each of these green boxes as just being a different, um, prediction value from the from output units in the previous in, in the previous layer and then um, on the other on the other hand you have this context uh, which I mean they really they call it a context but it's really just the regular input uh, to the network and that's and so this input is going in each unit is getting getting this input now so it's not just the units in the first layer it's every single unit is getting this uh, this input and that is um, based on a context function, which you know we can go into the details about that later. It's selecting one of um, one of say k weights. So so each unit has its own set of weight vectors, and it's selecting one of those, and that that one which gets selected um, gets applied to the weights, and um, and then ultimately based on that, that's how the prediction is made. Now I drew these squiggly lines here because there's actually some other stuff that's going on uh, uh, going on here, but um, we can talk about the details of that later. But from a very high level idea. Um, you have, really you have, like, you have like this squiggly lines. <laughs> <laughs> you have you have this you have this um, you have this this unit actually has multiple weight vectors which it can apply to the input and based on the input um, it, uh, sorry which it can apply to the incoming prediction values and based on the input it's selecting which one should get applied so it's sort of like uh, picking pick it's basically picking which weight um, it's applying here and these weights are ultimately as they describe it in the paper uh, it's basically just weighing the different probability values here, which I found that kind of interesting because if all the units in the in the previous layer are making the correct, correct prediction value, then it doesn't really matter how you're weighing them, right? But I guess it, there, there, it must be that um, they might, they must, they must have some non, um, I guess, non-uniform type of distribution across the predictions in the previous value. And that's why they would need um, all these different weights to- um, yeah. I, I think that what I got out of it is you think of the predictions from the previous layers as a bunch of experts, and this is doing a kind of a mixture of experts uh, rule. If you look at one of these weight vectors, it's weighing the experts differently, and how you weight them can depend on the context. Yeah. So for certain contexts, you may prefer uh, certain experts more. For other contexts, you prefer other experts more. Is it, does, it, does it choose one weight, or does it choose a mixture of weights, sir? It just chooses one. So you're basically saying I'm going to just go with one expert, is that right? Then? No, no, no. Each each of these Ws is a whole vector that no. uh, has a value for each expert. So it's going, to, it's choosing which weighting of the experts to use. But in all cases, it's using all the experts. Oh, oh I'm confused by that. So, so W1. So let's say there are ten experts. W1 yeah. would 
10 different numbers. W2 would have 10 different numbers and so on. And it's just choosing which weighting to use. Oh, uh, which distribution of vectors I'm going to use at this time. Yeah. So W is a vector of weight of weights. Yeah. I see. And Karan, it took me a, uh, is this, that the context, the way the calling this context was really confusing to me for uh, when I was trying to skim through the paper, because it, it's, as you said, it, it looks like it's just the input vector. Yeah, I think, I think it is just the input vector. And in fact, they call it there, they call it a side information, which is, yeah, which is even <laughs> more strange because it's not side information. It's the, it's the main it's input. It's the main information. Yeah. So it's, and that's true even in all the experiments, they didn't do something else with it. It's always exactly yeah. the input vector. That's yeah. So, yeah. so in terms of if, if it was applied to like an image task, the, the context would be the vector of pixel intensity values. And that would be input to every node throughout the hierarchy. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So Thanks. how does it, how does it choose which, which of the uh, weights to use at any one particular node? So the context function, uh, that that's what it's designed to do. It's, it's basically saying, I mean, it's basically a fixed context function that's in, in randomly initialized and based on, you know, whatever um, output, like, I guess it's just doing a bunch of inner products with the, with the, with the input here. Um, whatever the output is, it's selecting which one of these um, weights to apply based on that. And that context function is not learned. It's kept fixed throughout. Okay. So is it trying to maximize or, I mean, what's, what's the, how do, what's the choice criteria? Oh, I see. Um, no. So it's, uh, is this actually, this, this half space gating stuff? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, I, so Kevin, I have a slide later on, which will sort of explain how it's picking it. So it's okay, but but like just just to summarize it in one sentence, it's basically um, of of all the of all the possible. If you think about the input and, and and being in an input space, then it's basically dividing up the input space and saying wherever this input falls, pick the weight based on which um, I guess subset of the input space it's in. Okay, so so then to train this guy, um, you can think just think of this individual unit as just being like a whole uh, as a whole neural network. So this this outputs a prediction, and that prediction goes into a, a a negative log likelihood function. And based on that, you can just update, you can just do a gradient step on the weight that was selected in that forward pass right away. And so you do that individually for each unit here. So there's no global loss. It's just each unit will have its own loss based on its prediction. And and only the weight that is used in making that prediction gets updated. None of the other weights are touched in the, in the, when we do the update. Okay, so um, this is uh, the diagram that they had in their, uh, uh, in their paper, but I guess, I, I, I don't know if this is more complicated to look at or if the one I uh, gave you, or the, if the one I demonstrated was easier. Uh, I think but, yours was easier. Yeah, okay. yeah <laughs> we, can, <laughs> we can just skip this then. But, but, um, so yeah, I just want, yeah, okay. All right, so Kevin, going back to your question, um, I, so this is what's happening. Um, you can think of this as uh, you can think of this x as representing one input, and so you know you take that image, you you vectorize it, uh, that image that is your input, you vectorize it, and then it falls somewhere in this space. And and what they've done with these context functions is that they've basically divided up the input space so that a different set of weights is chosen for each um, for each unit based on where this input is. Uh, where this input is. And the, and the whole idea here is that if you have two things that are really close together, you'll have the same, um, you'll have the same weight, you'll have the same weights that are chosen for the entire model. So that's how it's picking out what the, uh, the input is, what the weights should be. Okay. Um, now I wanted to compare this to our dendrite layer that we've been working on here. I just so, asked, sorry. Um, yeah. So I guess, is a hyperparameter that um, do they is that generally the same as the number of classes or? Sorry, I, th I think you cut out for a second. You know, oh, sorry. I was just wondering is is k then set the number of weight vectors? Is that set to the same as the number of classes? I don't. Uh, actually, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Uh, I don't think so. I think each each network is predicting uh, is doing a binary classification. Oh um, yeah, but then but k presumably isn't just two. No, no, no. It's it's more than two. Yeah, exactly. So it's not tied to the number of classes. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> it's a little. Bit. 
I think I think it might have been uh, I think K might have always been a power of two since because of the half space gating, you're um, each time you're dividing the subspace in, in half, right? So I think it K might be some some arbitrary power of two. But I'm not, I'd have to look at that again. Okay, so uh, to compare this to our dendrite layers that we've been working on, um, so here's how it differs. Um, so here, I put context here in quotations because really it's just their regular input. Um, whereas our context is really a context because that's something that we derive based on the input. So with their context, uh, they're, they're picking out which weight uh, to use. Uh, and then they're applying that to the predictions from the previous layer. Whereas in our case, when we have with our context, we're applying so all these W's here. They're the they're the different um, I guess dendrite weights, and they're just they're just all weight vectors too that we apply to our context input. Um, and then W star here is the feed forward uh, weight. So here we're 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 taking all these weights and we're applying them, and then we're selecting the activation we want to use based on some criteria like maximum, right? Whereas here. There's no criteria like that. It's just you know whatever whatever the their context function selects, just apply that one. So the, it's already pre predetermined there which one they're going to apply. Whereas we're um, we're I guess trying them all out and then selecting which activation value we want to use. Karan, what I mean, I haven't read the paper, but the you know they're calling it context to me. I mean, if you call it a global context because it's being it's it's being sent to all the nodes. If, if you put global in front of the context and it kind of makes sense because you've basically structured space a particular way with these with these uh, weight vectors and everyone's looking at that global context whereas what you have on the left is a local context. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. So, it's, so on the right, it should be global context and on the left, it's local context. Yeah, but keep in mind the global context is just the input vector. Yeah. That is all it is. <laughs> but, but it's being applied to every single node so it's it's shared information yeah exactly so it's like every node is getting seeing the entire input vector right so in in that in, which i don't think of it as context i wouldn't even call it context at all i would just call it global input in yeah, that case global input. you know it's not well, there's no context it's it is the input like if it's mnist it is the digits that are coming okay. in the, the the way the way that i would i would i would i would look at it is given that kind of binary separation space that you showed in the previous diagram, that structured space, that's the context in which you're trying to solve the problem. As yeah, but that happens after, that happens after. That's not the context. That's how you treat the context. Well, the, the, the splitting into those different half spaces that happens inside the context function, which is inside the dotted square. Yeah. The yeah. input okay, but, that's coming in is just the input vector. Yeah. Okay. All right, so so those W's are not the context you're saying. No, no, these are all the W's are just weights here in this case. Okay, okay, my mistake. Okay. And the the weights are, don't even correspond to those half spaces. I, yeah. Karan, I don't think you had the context function in here. No, I didn't. I didn't include that. But but yeah, so the context. I mean, this this global input um, goes into a context function, and then that is how the weight gets selected. Yeah, okay. so basically here there's a, a, a box here that takes the input, the input vector, which in MNIST would just be the images, and coming out of here would be an index, an integer that's from one through K. Okay. You know, uh, and then that K will select the, that index will select the weight vector. And okay. that's, and, and that box, that red box that I drew corresponds to that half space gating thing. Okay, so the so the diagram where it showed all that separation, that that structure of that space, is that static during the entire use? Yes, that's fixed. Okay, and that's determined by what's... That's that's initialized um, ran randomly in the beginning, but they, they, they do it so that they're roughly breaking it up evenly. They're breaking up the space evenly. Okay, so the what what defines that space is what set of values? Uh, it's the it's the input space. So if you have um, say um, if you have like a 28 by 28 MNIST image, then that's vectorized and each dimension corresponds to uh, pixel intensity along each dimension, along each pixel. Okay. Uh, all right. 
So yeah, so each of these really has, a, you know, is getting this 28 by 28 input and inside this box, there's a random set of hyperplanes that's carving up the space. Um, and based on that, let's say there are five hyperplanes, that means there would be 32 possible, uh, there's 32 possible regions. And so K would be 32. Okay, so that, on... that box is different for each of the nodes? That the, the choice of those hyperplanes is different for each of the nodes? I'm not sure, is it? No, I think, I think there, um, that was supposed, that uh, picture that I showed you, which, uh, let's see if I can go back to that. It's supposed to, this is supposed to be global. Uh, I, I do believe. Um, so hmm. this is, this corresponds to one set of weight. So this position that this X is in, it corresponds to one set of weights in each of the, um, in each of the different units in the whole network. Okay, so it's distance from plane, so to speak. Uh, I don't know. No, that... you know, each of those points, each of those things has a set of weights associated with it. Right, okay. It, it's, uh, maybe I'm thinking of the dual problem, but that would be what I would call barycentric coordinates. So, yeah, so, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll go and read the paper and figure out what, what uh, uh, the answer is it, it, was, it was confusing, so I may have it completely wrong too. <laughs> oh. it, it's very unusual. Just to clarify on the, the red box you just chose. So that's that's a random transformation, right? That and it's static during training. It's not trained. It doesn't that's have right. parameters which are trained, right? That's right. It's it doesn't get trained. Okay. And it's random initial. There is no like special heuristic that defines how it's no, exactly exactly. Okay. And what does the weekly line defines again? Why is it squiggly? Like squiggly? Squiggly, okay. Yeah, <laughs> Why okay. is it squiggly? Because um, there's actually some other stuff that's happening here, but these are just all other mathematical operations, which I guess they're not too important in terms of understanding the high level idea of what this unit is doing. But, uh, yeah. but I'll talk about those soon. Okay, uh, thanks. Yeah. So, so I guess uh, just to summarize this, the, the main difference is here is that, um, you know, we're on one hand, uh, the forward pass that we compute is always, um, there's always one set of, there's always one weight vector that we're applying to the inputs here. Uh, and then that gets modified by um, an activation based on these different uh, dendrite weights. Whereas here, they're, they're basically picking um, which free forward weight vector to apply to their input um, instead, of, instead of doing one uh, deterministic um, forward transformation and then applying something to that. So I guess that's, so it, it's, bit different from ours, but I'd still see the, the, the usefulness of this in, in that, you know, based on, uh, based on the input, it's, a, it's returning a different output based on what, it, how it thinks it should be transformed. All right. Okay, so, um, so now Lucas, you were asking about the squiggly line. So this is what's really happening here. Um, so this, all these predictions come in from the previous layer. Uh, logit is just inverse sigmoid function, which it applies and it applies the weights. Uh, it puts it through a sigmoid to get it be, to get it to be, go between zero and one, and then it outputs the prediction. So, I mean, mathematically, this is what it looks like. But the reason that they're doing this um, is just to get this nice property, where um, you know this is just the output of one particular unit. But if you write this in, I guess, in matrix form, and then you unroll this all the way, since basically P is basically just the output prediction from the previous layer, and this is the one from the current layer then if you unroll this, you end up, uh, the output can actually be expressed in this form where it's just a sigmoid of a bunch of the product of um, matrices. And those matrices are all data dependent because whatever the input is, um, which is the global input, which is Z, that's determining what um, each, the, what the matrix in each layer should be. So this condenses down to like, I guess, this, once you know what the global input is, this condenses down to just one matrix and the sigmoid of that. So it's basically just like a linear classifier, but that linear classifier is uh, is dependent on what the input is, right? So based on based on the input, it's like it's sort of it's shifting its classification boundary. So that's the that's the idea of what it, what it's doing here, uh, and that's why it's called a gated linear network. I mean, uh, so that nice uh, mathematical property. It's useful uh, for inference, I guess, but for training, you are still calculating uh, a loss at each uh, neuron, basically, right? Yeah, so because, because, yeah, because you're 
training them each separately. Okay, so that doesn't make a difference in the yeah, fish yeah. during training, so. right? Not here, yeah. Wait, wait, did you say uh, efficiency? Yeah, I mean, aren't you saying that you have this nice mathematical property that you you can cancel all the sigmoids and then you you only have to apply sigmoid uh, at the beginning and then the inverse at the end? To but get that's, the that's, that's only for the, that's only to, I guess, I guess, this is just to interpret what it's doing, or maybe they designed it this way so that it's just a linear uh, classification boundary that's shifting based on whatever the input is. But um, but you can't you can't multiply these um, I guess all in all a priori just because um, what the values of these Ws are dependent on what the Z is. Mm, yeah. Okay. So, so, but so it's not useful when it's training at all. That's your point. Okay. Um, so they applied this to continual learning uh, on permuted MNIST. And so here, basically, they compared against um, EWC. Uh, and so I guess uh, there's just the red line. It, they show that it generally tends to perform pretty well. And I guess in, at times even performs uh, better than EWC. So what's happening here is that um, each horizontal line is um, each, each row corresponds to a new task being learned. And then the, the columns are... Um, the accuracy that it uh, achieved on um, one of the previously learned tasks. So, so I, they, they showed that it generally um, tends to do pretty well, uh, even, even better than EWC, I guess, because once you get up to these many, once you get up to eight different tasks, I guess, Lucas, um, you might be the most familiar with EWC here, but I guess there are a lot of constraints on the, on the, on the weights, right? So fewer weights are shifting around. And so that's why it's, it's EWC is taking a much longer time to, to learn that. Yeah, but the, the, there are also two versions, or like the original version, where you are, you have all the constraints individually. But and there is the online EWC version, uh, where you're always constraining on the last one, and you consider the last one was constrained on the the previous one, and so on and so forth. So I don't know which version they are comparing against here. Oh, uh, no, I'm not sure either. Okay, um, I think this is the last slide. Uh, so. About continual learning, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about why neural networks generally fail at continual learning. And I think this diagram um, generally sums up what my my model of how why they fail. So, say you have a, a neural network model that's so this is this is parameter space, right? So these contours represent, um, I guess, the the loss function that is trying to optimize for a certain task, and the and the the different dimensions here just uh, represent different um, or the different points in the space just represent uh, different. Um, initialization of the neural network based on its parameters. So say it gets initialized here, right? And then it learns to do task A. So uh, it moves over here because now you've updated the weight so that it's it's at this point here. But then you want to learn to do task B. So then all of a sudden, um, you know, you ignore these contours here and you're only paying attention to this. And so you move over here. And this is why you completely forget how you how to do task A because you've completely ignored what the loss here looks like. And so now um, on this, on so on task A, once you're at this point over here, the loss is really high on task A, even though you've gotten good at task B, and so it's forget forgetting to do it. But um, but that that's the case when I guess you have uh, a network with a fixed set of weights, and it seems to me like um, once you have these sort of I guess um, once you have a like a gated linear network, which is you know adapting the weights based on what the input is, or or something like a, a dendrite layer, which is also I guess. Um, Picking different, um, or I guess, um, picking different weights. Different weights affect the output based on what the based on what the context is. In those cases, I don't. I'm, I'm not sure if this sort of a diagram applies there because even though you are still optimizing a loss function, some of the, some a lot of your parameters that might be used for task A won't even get updated for task B because you're using different set of dendrite weights. So you're using a different set of weights um, in the unit of a of a gated linear network, and so. Um, I guess when when they say when they claim that you know they they are able to do a lot better on continual learning than typical neural networks, what might be happening is one one way that I'm trying trying to think about how to think about what's going on in this diagram is that they, it's not just the, their net, their model might not be just be represented by a single point in this space, but possibly different points in this space based on what the input is. So you know it, it could possibly be um, here at this point that's optimal for task A and here at this point that's optimal for task B, um, but with different sets of weights. And those different sets of weights are determined by different inputs. 
Brian, I, I got lost in some of this, and so I'm, I'm going to ask a very basic question. Hope you don't mind. When we were talking earlier, we basically say, hey, they solved the MDIS task by creating multiple networks, each for each class. And so um, uh, it seems to me then there isn't a single point moving around in the diagram like this, right? You have, you have N networks, each one trying to optimize one of N tasks. It, it, we still talking about that? Is that still the basic thing that's going on here um, in these gated networks? Um. I mean, you might have moved away from that. I, I lost track of it, so I'm, I don't want to just do your help. I actually had, had a similar question, Jeff, so <laughs> I'm also okay. So, so that, I mean, it, it, that's a very simple way of, uh, the most trivial way in some sense of solving a continuous learning problem is you just have N networks for N tasks, and then each network doesn't have to learn more than one thing, and therefore can't forget what it learned. No, but I don't, I don't think it's like that, actually. I think- Okay, uh, so what am I missing about that? So I think, so what I mentioned earlier is that they have a different network for each category. So they would have 10, yeah. they have 10 categories they're trying to classify, and those would have yeah. one network, which is doing a yes or no for each of those. Yeah. But as you increase the number of tasks, which is just a different permutation of the pixels, um, you're still- number task, The number of tasks being the number of categories, or it means something else? No, I think your number of tasks in permuted MNIST is the number of different permutations of the pixels. How's that a different task? It's, it's all in the same classifier, right? I mean, you're trying to classify one thing. You, you have different inputs, right? But you're, you're still classifying it as one thing, right? Yeah, so for example, in the first task, you say for the first classifier, it has a picture of a zero and it's trying mm -hmm. to say, yes or no, is this a zero? But in task two in permuted MNIST, what you've done is you've just permuted the pixels of that zero. So now it's like, um, it just, it even, it's technically, scrambled. A zero, it's just been scrambled. But it's still but a zero, is it not? Yeah, but it's, well, yes. It won't look even anything though, like a zero. It'll be random. Would, would it look like something else? No, it'd be random dots. So how does that really, I mean, so what's, what's the importance of that? That, that seems weird. <laughs> it's, it's the same permutation applied to each of the, um, each of the images. So yeah, but, it should so be able to pick up on that. A permuted MNIST is like the most bizarre thing going it's like it's such a weird uh it, the benchmark is just people just end up using it because it's it's convenient because you can create all of these different like variations a, of yeah, it from yeah. the same thing but it means it would like a human would not be able to do per minute so i think i mean this i mean we just it's took completely a, really, a random thing okay so let's just take a really top high level view of this i like your diagram here i think it reflects my understanding of what the problem is um but let's take a very high level view on it. Um, the, the, the problem of continuous learning is in a sense like, well, I have a set of synapses which have been trained to do something. And if I now train to do something different, if I'm modifying those same synapses, I'm gonna forget the thing I learned earlier. Um, and that's just, that's just a basic sort of statement. Um, and so the way we solve that in, or we think the neurons solve that in the, in the brain is, that we, the synapses are not shared across all these different tasks. And, and this is, comes about from two things. One is we have these very sparse activations. So neurons are not participating in, in all the different, each neuron is only participating in a small subset of the tasks involved. And then within each neuron, we have these different dendritic branches and each of those is, sub, is, is, uh, is participating in a subset uh, of, the, of the activities of that particular neuron. So when you multiply these together, individual synapses on an individual branch, not the proximal synapses, but the distal synapses, are, are rarely used and therefore left untouched most of the time, except for the tasks that they were originally trained for. So you're basically separating out a set of the, the set of synapses uh, that are gonna be involved. You're making them unlikely that they're gonna be involved in multiple activities of the network. So when you, when you do that the way we think the neurons are doing it, which the individual neurons have these sparse activations plus um, lots of dendritic branches, or you do it by having multiple networks, each one is individually solving a problem, but when you, when you, you give it a new task, it doesn't get involved in that task. That seems to be, you're essentially achieving the same thing. Don't use the same synapses for different tasks or try to minimize that. But um, so that seems to be the sort of, basic Uber idea, uh, although I think the idea of using multiple networks as they're doing here is, is not a very rewarding one. It's not a very, it does not have one that's up, a lot of legs to it, it seems to me. Um, so in, if I'm getting that wrong, just let me know because I, that's, that's the way I look at that. Um, I, think, I think that's right, but um, 
in terms of the multiple networks, um, I think you could pretend, you could think of them as it, you could think of it as possibly being one network with like, I guess, 10 different parts that don't interact with each other. Yeah, but, all, but, but that's, and, the problem with that is that you're, then you're ending up with the grandmother networks, right? Instead of grandmother cells, you got grandmother networks. And, and that just can't scale. It's just not possible. I mean, so we know the brain scales by using sparsity. And when you have sparsity and enough units or enough anything, then you can have these very, very huge numbers of solutions or, or tasks that can be solved. And almost none of those guys overlap. Um, they overlap a little bit. You know, the thing about sparse representations, you, 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 you have these astronomical number of representations you can form in a, in a network of 10,000 neurons and they all overlap a little bit, but they don't overlap enough to make any difference. So it, it, this, as soon as you go to the grandmother cell encoding or the grandmother network encoding, you just have this huge limitation. You don't get any of that scaling issues. Um, so yes, it could work on a small number of tasks, but it just doesn't scale. Um, multiple independent networks that don't interact. I mean, that's the beauty of sparse representations. They allow you to have these monstrously large representation spaces that are easily discernible, always, realistically, and reliably, yet, and they overlap a little bit, but the little bit doesn't matter. So that's, that's the solution nature came up with. Um, so I, I'm not disagreeing with anything you said here. I'm just trying to restate the, the sort of the basic premise is that you need to not have synapses shared between different solutions, um, but it's okay if they're shared over a very small amount of time um, and the system still works really well. Yeah, is because that, of the distributed nature, you can get essentially, it's, it's like having lots and lots, you know, millions of networks kind of superimpose one on top of the other, but. Exactly, that's what it is. And it's, and it's fine for neurons to be shared between tasks, that's totally yeah, fine. As yeah. long as it's a sparse sharing, right? Yeah. As long as, it, yeah. you know, again, what if we say 2%, you know, a neuron's only active one out of 50 tasks, if it's 2% activation. And then, um, and then again, the synapses in that neuron might be one out of a hundred different, uh, or a couple hundred different uh, dendritic segments. So you multiply that 50, times like a couple hundred and now you're up into you know larger numbers and it's yeah. all one network right it's all one network where it's, where it's sort of slightly but it's actually a lot of different networks are slightly overlapping i i think yeah. that's what you're saying groups of that's a good way of yeah. phrasing it but that overlapping piece is essential because you, you can't get there with, with, um, with yeah family. i i think the reason uh you know we went through this is just that it's it's sort of in the space of deep learning networks this is sort of comes somewhat close to that idea, but it's still, you know, very brute force. As no, I, I'm not, I'm not, I think it was great when through this. I, I'm not critical of that at all. I just want to make sure we, we walk away with the right understanding of it, the right analysis of the right, you know, what did we learn yeah. from this? Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting, Karan, if you go back to the permuted MNIST slide. Um, yeah, here. Yeah, so, so just kind of re restating a little bit what Jeff said, what they're doing is they, they basically, you know, each, they have, 10 different networks for the 10 categories. Then each each network is a gated linear network. And then for each task, it kind of figures out some subset to invoke somehow, you know, with this context function and this half space mm -hmm. gating. Right. And so, but it's interesting to compare this with the supermass paper, where you have it's closer to the way we think about it. It's one large network, and then you have lots of kind of overlapping subnetworks superimposed on there and each subnetwork is assigned to a task, right? Um, and, you know, there you can have millions of these subnetworks superimposed. They're actually, and in that, they also tried the MNIST, uh, permuted MNIST task. And here they're showing up to task eight. Um, in, in the supermass paper, they were able to go to a thousand tasks uh, with the same network, you know? So it's exactly this capacity argument Again, you know, these guys are going to run into really big limitations. They can't possibly go to a thousand tasks, at least, yeah. unless, you know. Um, so anyway, that it just thought it was interesting to sort of compare the two. It's sort of similar intuitions, but at the, at some level, but completely different implementation. And once you oh. have this distributed nature, you suddenly get this huge benefit that you don't, you know, exactly what Jeff was saying, um, that these guys might not get. Karan, could, get you, get could I get you to go to the last slide again for a second? 
So when you were saying that you think that they, uh, they could hold on to task A and task B, in this case, task is learning a permutation of, of you know, you know as you're trying to learn the distortion that's being applied to the, to the, uh, uh, to the character. So I'm, I'm wondering if you think they can hold on to both A and B, did they make any stabs at what they thought their capacity of their network was? Capacity meaning how many different tasks they could learn? Yes. Um, if, if you're basically saying that they are holding on to task A and task B on those two different spaces, that implies some kind of metric or would imply some kind of metric for uh, when they run out of something in order to be able to do that. I'm just wondering if they made any stabs in that direction in the paper. They didn't uh, make any claims about it, but I think uh, it probably has to do with however many different weights each individual unit has. Because, I mean, if you only have like three or four different um, weights, then I, I see it very unlikely that they'd be able to scale the their number of tasks that they can hold on to beyond like five or 10. Okay. So I, I think that's probably their... Um, their limiting factor. It's the, it's the number of weights each uh, individual, each number of different weights that each individual unit has in the gated linear network. Whereas Subatai, what would it be in the case of super masks? What would, ha what would have to, what would, they, what would they have to increase in order to be able to continually learn more tasks? Not much. Um, the, the capacity would be really high because what, they don't have sparsity, but what they have is, let's say you have a big network, um, and for any given task, you instantiate, let's say 50% of that network randomly, right? And so if you have a thousand units and you're invoking 500 at a time, you have a thousand choose 500 possible networks. Yep. Um, and you, it's gonna be less than that because you want the networks to be a little bit different from one another. It's not enough if just one unit is different. So it's the same kind of SDR concepts. Uh, so the capacity they have there for different tasks is huge. Yeah. Um, and so if the network is large enough and they have a good enough way of finding these sub-networks, then uh, they, they, they don't have to increase much. That's kind of the beauty of these distributed representations. Okay. So, um, so, yeah, so I guess that sounds right. There, theirs would be yeah. would scale a lot better. Yeah. The issue they have is they don't have a good way of selecting which sub-networks. So they have this kind of hacky outer loop where they go through and pick different random seeds and, and go through this um, uh, you know, great uh, loss function where they're trying to uh, update which individual connection should be used or not used. Um, and, and they have this sort of whole outer loop, which is not really part of the network itself. Whereas in the brain, all this has to be embedded in the networks. And this is one of the things I think dendrites are really good at doing, facilitating that kind of stuff. So anyways, I'm, I'm, I'm just wrapping up here. And I guess um, before we got into that discussion, the, the point I was trying to make was that um, uh, all these uh, networks, like whether it's our, whether it's the GLMs that I just talked about or the, or, um, or, or, or our dendrite networks or uh, super masks. Well, I think what one thing that they all share in common and why they're generally better than a regular neural network at doing um, these sort of uh, continual learning tasks is because um, you know, based on the input, a different set of, set of weights are applied, right? And that's and that's sort of Jeff, what you talked about with you know different the synapse is not changing once you learn once you learn to do the next task. And so, I guess for there's I guess so in 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 relation to this diagram, you can you don't think of the model as being at a single point in this space. You can think of it as possibly being at different points based on whatever um, whatever weights or parameters are invoked based on the input. And so I think that's. That's part of that's possibly one reason why um, all these these three different models have um, have have some success uh, at continual learning, even though some are have had more success than the others. I think that is the reason why. I mean, it, it, it it's just a very basic thing is to say, well, yeah. one, one set of synapses is dedicated to one task, and another set of synapses is dedicated to another task, and yeah, and uh, that's why you don't forget, you know. <laughs> I think it's interesting. I, what surprises me is the unreasonable success of convolutional neural networks of, you know, or, or networks that are, um, are densely activated. I mean, to, to get them to solve uh, uh, these problems, 
you, you have to be very, you have to be, it's, it, and, you're, and you're updating all the synapses all the time. It's amazing that it works because you have to be tweaking every synapse to just a little bit negative, a little bit positive, this way, this way, this way, so that, that it still solves the problem. I, I guess to me, the unreasonable answer is that, that these, these fully connected networks work at all. But the downside of it, but they clearly do, the downside of it is you have these very difficult training paradigms where you have to be very careful how you go about training things and make sure they're evenly distributed and there's different epochs and you have to be uh, you have to train incrementally very slowly so that you don't so they, these networks settle out. So it's, to me, it's sort of obvious, like oh, this is the way it should work, the way you're talking about this paper. Uh, but it's really if you someone told me that you'd be able to get these fully connected uh, networks to settle on very complex problems, I would have predicted they couldn't because it's just too hard a problem, but they obviously do. So, <laughs> so that's to me the weird thing that, that uh, works at all. Convolutional networks uh, also have shared weight, right? They're not fully connected. They're dense, but they share weights. Like the, the kernel goes uh, throughout the- they Yeah, just... yeah, yeah. I guess I take out the convolution step, I guess. And, uh, just take that out for a moment. I'm just saying in general, I fully, a fully connected, fully activated uh, network that they can settle on solutions um, is surprising to me. You know, it's, it's I don't, I don't, I have a visualization in my head of what this looks like, but you know, <laughs> it's, it's surprising. <laughs> it, it just tells you that the, the, and I think it tells you that these networks are very, very sensitive because they're going to be trying to just tweak these synapses just throughout, just so to make everything work. And that's why they have to have high precision in general. And it's also why they're susceptible to um, uh, errors, uh, surprising errors, you know, adversarial attacks. It's because they're very, very, they, they, they end up with a very fragile solution that just so works most of the time because <laughs> it's right on the edge of not working. Um, anyway. anyway. All right. I think it was a good presentation. All right, that's all I got. That was good. Yeah, thanks, Karan. That was great. Thanks. I also thought their kind of their mixture function, the way they were doing that inverse sigmoid and things, that was kind of interesting. And maybe we can think about something like that in our as a dendrite function. So, yeah, I think uh, the main reason they were, or I guess the main reason they were doing that is because, um, like, if, if you, I guess, if you write out the expression of what the output is, like I showed, um, it's basically just. Uh, a different um, a different line in the input space that's classifying that that I guess that's that's the decision boundary, and so they're doing that so that they can so that it ends up mathematically just ends up being a linear classifier, and it just shifts based on what the input is. Yeah, but I think the way they had it, um, like any one of those could veto the output completely, um, which is uh, so from a gating standpoint, that's it's kind of nice that way. <laughs> 